Welcome back and today we're going to be solving question 22 from the 2023 ICHO prep problems and this one is called enabling electricity. The use of electrochemical methods can sometimes yield products that are otherwise not easily accessible. During these reactions, oxidized slash reduced intermediates react rapidly with nucleophiles, electrophiles present in the, reaction, in the reaction mixture. For anodic oxidation reactions, this oftentimes is the solvent. That's an important piece of information to keep note of. Electrolysis of carboxylic acids with relatively high current densities can lead to the formation of highly reactive carboxyl radicals and subsequent decarboxylation. So what this is telling me is basically the first step of the mechanism. So we have this ugly mess, which is basically a carboxylic acid with an alkyne and two alkene sections and also a and also an amid bond. And then we have propanoic acid. We electrolyze it in potassium hydroxide and methanol, and we get A, which is 13 carbons, 19 hydrogens, one nitrogen, one oxygen. So let's see how many carbons this one has. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So it has 12 carbons. It told us that it's going to be a decarboxylation, so minus 1. So 12 minus 1 is, of course, 11. And we're aiming for 13. So we need two more from somehow, from somewhere. Now notice that this is also a carboxylic acid, and it has three carbon atoms. So if it decarboxylates, so if this thing goes away, we have two carbons. So that's a potential way to put together our 13 carbon sum. But let's try to figure out the mechanism. So it told us that electrolysis results in carboxyl radicals from carboxylic acids. So this is a carboxyl radical with the radical on the oxygen. And now this decarboxylates, as stated in the question. So what happens then is a CO2 is formed and a carbon-centered radical is also formed. So if I get rid of this real quick, we get this radical. And now we're going to want to trap the radical with something. There's three things that we can theoretically trap it with. We can trap it with the alkyne with or with the alkenes. Nothing else really because these are too close. So and it can't really be the alkyne because the best case scenario would be a one, two, three, four membered ring, which is not exactly great. So we can use the alkenes and there's two of them and both of them are identical. So we're just going to react it with this guy over here because it's physically closer in the drawing. So what we're going to do is draw our half arrows again and do that. And this is going to result in a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 membered ring. Let me draw what we get. So we have a 5 membered ring with an amide inside. And then we have this section over here. We have a methyl radical coming off over here. And we have our propargyl section over here. Now this one should have 11 carbons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 carbons. So now we need two more carbons. So as I said, we're going to look at this and we're going to decarboxylate it. So again, we need the carboxyl radical, which is this guy over here. That does our standard decarboxylation mechanism, which results in an ethyl radical. And now if we just combine the two, so this one, and this one, then what we get is I'm going to just delete this and draw a so that was our methyl that was already there. And then we add the ethyl. It's this is the termination step pretty much. Now let's check if the molecular formula is correct. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 carbons. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 carbons, 1 nitrogen, and 1 oxygen. So this is going to be compound A. This was a pretty hard question. I'm not a fan of this question because it I, I don't feel like it gives you enough information to unambiguously figure out what the result is, but... It is what it is. It's still a question that we got to solve. So 22.1, provide the structural formula for A. Hint, catalytic hydrogenation of product A consumes three equivalents of hydrogen. So that's also a little bit of information that we could use. It, this uses one equivalent. This uses two equivalents. So we're good. All right, moving on to, all right, moving on to question 22.2. The previous reaction yields product A in 64% yield with a ferratic, ferratic, however you want to pronounce that, efficiency of 29%. 
Calculate the charge accumulated in coulombs over the course of the experiment if 2.8 millimoles of A was obtained. Right, so the way you do this is the moles of electrons is going to be 2.8 millimoles, which is 0 0.0028 moles, times 2, because remember, we used one mole of electron here and another mole of electrons over here. So that's why one reaction consumes two moles of electrons. And then we divide this by 0 0.29 for the efficiency. And that gives us 0 0.0193 moles of electrons. And now if we just multiply this by 96,485, which is the number of coulombs in a mole of electrons, then we get 1,863 coulombs. All right, so moving on to the next question. The RVC, which is the reticulated vitreous carbon, whatever that means, anode used below is a, foam, is a foam made of glassy carbon that can provide high current densities. This gives you zero information that you would need to use in the question. 22.3, provide the structure of compound B, no stereochemistry required. This reaction leads to two condensed cyclohexane rings and an acetal structure. All right, so the first thing I notice when I read this is the acetal structure. So acetals have two oxygens. These, this section over here has two oxygens. It basically looks like ethylene glycol, so it might give you an idea that we're going to get an acetal like this. Now, what is the other building block of an acetal? Remember, you can use a diol like this plus an aldehyde to form the acetal, so we're going to look for an aldehyde. Now if you look over here, this is a masked aldehyde. If we get rid of this section over here, we would get this vinyl alcohol, which tautomerizes into this aldehyde, so we have the aldehyde. And then we need the two condensed six-membered rings, so we have one here already, and the other one is probably going to be over here. So let's say that's the case. We have one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms. That could work. Now let's try to figure out a mechanism for this. So as before, we've seen an OH. The the H got the H got taken off and got replaced by an electron, so like a radical, so a homolysis of the OH bond, and we get that. Now the thing that this can do is it can attack this double bond over here. So we do that, and then we put a radical electron on that carbon over there. So what we get is going to be, I'm just going to draw it again, six-membered ring, radical on that carbon, then we have the acetal section, again we don't need to show stereochemistry, and then we have this long side chain with the TMS, trimethylsilyl. Now let's take a look. We have C17H28O2, so we know that the TMS is going to get removed. And now let's try to figure out what's next in the mechanism. So we have the radical. The only thing that can trap it pretty much is going to be the double bond. So why don't we do that? So we're going to react it with the closer section because that's what we need to form a six-membered ring. This is a bit ugly. So the mechanism is going to look something like that. And then we get two six-membered rings with the acetal in the middle over here. And then we still have this little tail with the TMS over here and a radical over here. And now what can happen is this bond can break and it can basically form like a TMS radical, I guess, and it just forms a double bond. So just to save time, I will draw what that looks like over here. So that looks like this, and that is going to be our product, but let's double check the molecular formula. 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 carbons. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28 hydrogens, and 1, 2 oxygens. So that is correct. So that's going to be compound B. Now this, will, I, I feel like this was slightly better because there is a pretty unambiguous way of figuring out the mechanism. All right, next up, reactivity at the cathode can be quite different from the anode. The use of a divided cell can help to control the type of electrochemical reaction that is occurring. Question 22.4, provide the structure of compound C resulting from cathodic reduction followed by an aqueous workup. 
C contains two condensed cyclopentane rings. Once again, I don't like this question because I was not able to figure out the mechanism exactly, but we can still make predictions about what's gonna happen. So it contains two condensed cyclopentane rings. We already have one and we have two things coming off. So the third one's probably gonna be here. And in order to do that, we have, we need two extra carbons, right? Cause this is an oxygen and we need two extra carbons. We have the two carbons over here. So what's probably gonna happen is this carbon is somehow probably gonna attack that and it's gonna kick up that to form an OH. So I'm not sure what the exact mechanism is, but I'll draw approximately what you get if you do that. So you have an OH over here because right, it got kicked up. Or I'm sorry, I put it on the wrong carbon. An OH over there. And then you have something like a double bonded nitrogen with like a negative charge or something. Anyway, the point is, let's just pretend that's an imine and there is aqueous workup. So aqueous workup of imines results in a carbonyl. So this is gonna be compound C, and the thing I really hate about this question, it doesn't even give you the molecular formula to double check, which is incredibly mean, because how are you supposed to know that this is correct if you have zero indication? And it doesn't tell you what the reaction does. It doesn't tell you the first step of the mechanism. It doesn't tell you anything about, it, it doesn't tell you anything about the reaction at the cathode. All, all that it tells you is that it's some sort of reduction. So it, it I guess it adds an electron to the carbon, probably something, I'm not sure. But anyway, that is C, so we can move on. Alkene ketone coupling reactions can be achieved under electroreductive conditions. So this is gonna be pretty similar to the previous reaction. So basically the double bond is gonna get reduced and we're gonna put electrons over there somehow. Again, I'm not 100% sure about the mechanism, but then it just attacks the carbonyl and kicks up the electrons, then gets protonated. So what you get is gonna be a large molecule that I'm gonna draw over here on the side. So you get that. And again, it doesn't give you the molecular formula, so how are you supposed to check that it's correct? All I can tell you is just double check that the number of carbons is the same, which it is. So let's move on to 22.5. Provide the structure of product D. Oh, I already did that, so yeah. And then we have this big scheme which is looking very confusing. But the last question, 22.6, provide the structures of compounds E to I, stereochemistry not required. Hint, in the last reaction step, a new six-membered ring is formed. Okay, so that's the last reaction step, which is gonna be the cathodic reduction, if I'm not mistaken. But let's start from the beginning. So we have this bromomethyl um, furan, we reacted with n-butyl lithium and THF at minus 78 Celsius. Uh, with the bromine, this should scream a lithium halogen exchange. So what we get after the first step is going to be a lithiated furan. So like so. And then we have this, I don't even know what that's called. I don't know, a, oh, oxapro, oxacyclobutane, I think, technically. But anyway, this is effectively like a an epoxide. So we, we can attack it over here and kick that up. And then that'll give us something that looks like this. One, two, three carbons, and then the OH. And then after, and then we get the OH after the aqueous workup over here. And this is gonna be compound E. So let me make sure that the molecular formula matches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and two oxygens. So the molecular formula does match. Now we're oxidizing it and removing two hydrogens. So the only area where we could remove that from is over here, and it's gonna form an aldehyde. So let me copy paste this over here real quick and convert this to an aldehyde like so. Next up, we have this, I don't even know what it's called, I forget, but this is used in what is very similar to the, the the Wittig reaction. I think this is called the Wadsworth something, Emmons something. Anyway, it forms, if you just imagine that this is a halogen, it's the same as a, as a Wittig reaction. So what we're gonna get is I'm just gonna duplicate this furan section over here, and then you connect it like so, and then there's this ugly mess. And now you gotta check 
the molecular formula. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 carbons. So 19 carbons is correct. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 17, 18, 19 hydrogens. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4 oxygens and one nitrogen. So that is going to be compound G. And now if we look at the next step, which is methyl magnesium bromide in copper one bromide, that is going to be a conjugate addition of a methyl group. So that is usually added to alpha beta unsaturated ketones over here. So we should see an extra methyl group over here and no double bond. And that is what we see over here. It's contorted a little bit, but that's the same thing. Now with dibol, we remove nine carbons, a bunch of hydrogens, and two oxygens. So dibol is used to reduce esters and amides to aldehydes. So we have an amide over here, and that is going to reduce it to an aldehyde. So if I just draw the aldehyde real quick, and then we can check the molecular formula. So this should be our aldehyde. So basically, you just cut it over here and replace it with a hydrogen. And then molecular formula, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 carbons. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 hydrogens, and 2 oxygens. So that's going to be compound H. Now we do this reaction with this triflate triisopropyl silyl triflate in triethylamine, and we get this ugly mess. And now for the hard part, which is going to be the reaction, the electrochemical reaction. Now, if you go back down here, it gives you a hint. In the last reaction step, a new six-membered ring is formed. Now, if you just look at the conformation of this, they kind of help you because you can kind of start seeing a six-membered ring over here. And that is actually what the six member ring is going to be forming from. And now this is really hard because the silo, the, the silicon stays in place. So the silo, the triisopropyl silo is not touched. So what I think happens here, and I'm not 100% sure how you're supposed to figure this out, but I think what happens here is it mentioned the solvent in the beginning, if you remember. Now we have methanol as the solvent. If this methanol homolytically cleaves by induction from the reduction, then we have a methoxy radical. Now this methoxy radical can attack over here, which I know this is a little bit, it's gonna be a bit long, but just here's what happens. Bunch of electrons move around, and what we will end up with is these two double bonds shifted. Well, one of them is deleted, basically. We have a methoxy part over here, double bond over here, and a radical over here. And now the radical can attack this double bond to form the six-membered ring, and this can attack another methoxy radical and form another bond. So <laughs> this is a long step and a very, very confusing reaction. And once again, I really don't like this question because it does not give you enough information, in my opinion, to solve it. But you get the six-membered ring with the methyl still there. Then you get a single bond, a methoxy, and then you have the triisopropyl silyl over there. So this should be compound I, and let's double check the molecular formula. So triisopropyl is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 carbons. So far, so good. Then we have 7 hydrogens per isopropyl, so times 3 is 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, plus 3 is 42 hydrogens, so that's also correct. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 oxygens, and 1 silicon. So that matches the molecular formula, and looking at the solutions, that is the, the molecule that we're looking for. So that's the whole question. It, I, I personally am not a fan of it because I don't think it gives you enough information. I'm not going to lie. I was not able to solve this without looking at the solutions. But the reason I'm still making this video is because by me looking at the solutions, I feel like I can still make up a reasonable explanation for how you would be able to solve it without looking at the solutions. So if you still have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll try to answer all of them. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you were I hope you were able to learn something, and I'll see you in the next one.